Well, welcome to the Story of Liberty. This is John Bona and Jennifer Featherstone. Good afternoon. Matt Staver of Liberty Council is with us, and uh, he will be here, actually, in our area, Vero Beach, on Tuesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. at the First Church of God. Uh, so come out and join us. It's, it's a free event. And Matt, thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. You know, just to share a, a short story to our listeners, you know, about 12 years ago, we started the Vero Beach uh, Prayer Breakfast, my daughter and I and my wife. And some people tried to stop the event from taking place. Well, Matt, you may remember I called you. and uh, I do remember that. The Liberty Council advised us that these people really did not have the right to stop the prayer breakfast and that we had the right to have a religious event. The good news is we just completed our annual prayer breakfast and over 2,700 people attended this year from our area to hear the Robertson family of hit TV show Duck Dynasty speak and share their faith. Matt, I could tell you the responses from the uh, Christian community have been so very positive. So thank you, Matt Staver. Well, thank you for standing up. I remember when this was just a, an idea and you got pushback and you contacted Liberty Council and we worked with you and you kept on persisting. Yep. And now from that early stage, you've got a huge prayer breakfast. I mean, that's a large prayer breakfast to have nearly 3,000 people gathered for a prayer breakfast. That's that's large by any means, anywhere comparable in the country. And it all began because God gave you a vision. Satan tried to push back, but that's what happens. You don't go out looking for a battle, but Satan's going to try to stop you when you're wanting to share the gospel and enter the arena. And oftentimes we as Christians just simply give up the ground and back away, but you didn't. And uh, what he intended for evil, God intended for good. And now look what's happened. And this is just the beginning. Well, I, I, thank you, man. God's really blessed it. It's amazing. Well, there's a lot going on in uh, Indiana, huh? The Hoosier State with the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Tell us uh, what's going on there. Well, what is interesting is not that the Religious Freedom Restoration Act has changed, but how those that are pushing the same-sex marriage agenda and the homosexual rights agenda have literally come out of the closet and revealed how hostile they are to religious freedom. Because if you go back to 1993, the U.S. Congress passed this Religious Freedom Restoration Act on the federal level. It passed unanimously by voice vote in the House and 97 to 3 in the Senate, which is amazing considering all the rancor that you have in Congress now. And it was signed into law by President Bill Clinton. Wow. So liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans, they got together, they voted for this, and that became the template for the individual states. And since then, 19 states before Indiana passed these religious freedom restoration laws. And in fact, uh, I drafted the one that was passed in the late 1990s in Florida, and it's been in existence since then. So these laws have been on the books, both on the federal and state level, for 20-plus years. And before that, they were in the case law of the United States Supreme Court. So religious freedom and these specific laws in specific have been around for a long time. They haven't changed. Well, what changed in Indiana to cause such a furor? It's not the law, and it's not the principle. What has changed is what we said was evident a long time ago, but now has come to the surface, and that is this is a zero-sum game, not because we believe it's a zero-sum game or want it to be, but because that's their agenda. And what do I mean? There is a winner and a loser. There's no coexistence. There's no compromise. There's no tolerance. Although the words tolerance are used, they're really intolerant, and they're intolerant of any religious freedom that does not agree with, promote, or affirm same-sex marriage, same-sex unions, or the homosexual agenda. And that is what became evident in Indiana, and consequently there were intentional lies and distortion of the truth and hysteria that was presented. And you know what? Not one instance did they show of any case in 20-plus years in which the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or Religious Freedom in general, has been used successfully to illustrate their hysteria. Their hysteria was, if you pass this, then someone who's gay or lesbian, when they come to a restaurant, you're not going to have to serve that person a hamburger. Uh, if they want to rent a night in the hotel to spend the night there from a weary day of traveling, uh, you're going to be able to refuse that person simply because they're homosexual. Well, that's absolutely 
nonsense. And there's no reported case of ever having that happen using one of these laws. But that's what was presented to the media. That's what the media ran with. And that was the false story that they ultimately tried to pin on Indiana and Governor Mike Pence, who signed the law. Now, let me ask you something. Does the the new act that's being proposed, does it actually punish a person, a proposed fine on people who follow their, for example, a Christian belief about marriage? Could you be punished uh, for not making a wedding cake for a gay couple or uh, a Jewish man not wanting to print a swastika in a printing shop? I mean, it goes, but it's a two-way street, right? It's a two-way street. You know, here, here's an example. You have Baronelli Stutzman out west. And she has Arlene's Flowers, which is a florist shop. She's had it for a number of years. And for nine years, she has had a number of customers. And one particular customer is a person that she's baked cookies and cupcakes for. She's a friend, she thought, of this individual. And she's done all different kinds of flowers for this individual. Well, this individual then decided to get married to another man and came to Baronelli and said, I want you to cater my wedding. It's a same-sex wedding. And Baronelli said, I can't do this. The 70-year-old lady said, that conflicts with my religious belief. But there's another florist that will be able to do a good job. But I can't put my artistic values and, and enthusiasm into something that is contrary to my religious beliefs. You would think that this person whom she had known for nine years, she'd bake cupcakes and cookies and she had served him in other ways, would say, I understand and respect uh, your conscience here. I'll go down the street and have another florist do it. But no. Instead, that person filed suit against Baronelli for a civil rights complaint, and the attorney general came after her. And now they're going after both her personal finances and her business. And they want her to participate in a same-sex wedding. She can't do it. And there was a photographer in New Mexico who had something very similar. She has done photography for all kinds of people. She doesn't discriminate. She doesn't ask about somebody's sexual behavior or preference. And in the case that was brought against her when she said, I cannot cater uh, a photography service to a same-sex wedding because I have to put myself into it. It's something that somebody wants to memorialize and celebrate. And you've got to be a part of that whole ceremony and, and enjoy the moment and promote that moment with that couple. And she can't do that. She said, here's an illustration. Um, I don't discriminate against people who are white. I'll photograph their, their birthday parties, their graduation parties, their passport photos. But if someone who's white comes to me and says, I've got this special event I'm doing this weekend. I want you to do the photograph of it. It's a, an event I want to memorialize and, and keep a record of. So it's very important to me. Uh, what is it? Well, we're going to put on some hoods and uh, white hoods, and we're going to burn some crosses. It's a KKK rally, and, and it's something very meaningful to us. She would be able to say, and I think everyone would reasonably understand her position, I can't do that. I cannot participate in that. I'll photograph these other things, but I can't participate in an event that is contrary or a ceremony that conflicts with my values. But in that case, in New Mexico, she got fined. And the Supreme Court of that state, which did not have a religious freedom restoration law, said uh, you've got to compromise or set aside your religious beliefs because if you don't participate in a ceremony, then you're discriminated on the basis of sexual orientation, and that's contrary to the law. So, yes, what's happening around the country is people are being fined. In New Jersey, a Methodist association lost its property tax exemption because it refused to allow a facility on the beach in New Jersey to be used for a same-sex ceremony. A farmer in New York was fined about $12,000 because he didn't allow a facility on his farm to be used for a same-sex ceremony. So this is where the zero-sum game is, and this is why the religious freedom law was necessary to protect individuals' religious freedom, not to allow people to refuse someone to sit down at their restaurant, but to allow them to have religious freedom on a broad perspective and also to say you cannot force this person to participate in an event or a ceremony that openly contradicts and collides with the religious freedom. Absolutely. And, you know, the media has not been very good, and I'm saying that conservatively. Like, for instance, with the pizza situation that, we, you know, the media has been going crazy over, those people never even denied service to anybody. The entire crisis was manufactured. It was just 
completely unbelievable in my opinion. And the 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 pushback uh, from the media against these people, you know, having them having to shut their doors, uh, go underground, hiding from the public because of death threats. The whole thing is just so unethical from a journalistic standpoint. I can't even understand it. The awesome thing, though, is that then these people set up this um, GoFundMe campaign for them, and now they're close to a million dollars. So it shows what the public's view is versus what the media's manipulation is in these situations. These people have actually never denied gay people to come in their restaurants. It, that doesn't happen. I haven't heard that happening one time. All of these people serve their um, customers regardless of who they are. It's just that they can't be involved in a religious ceremony that violates their faith. It's in a religious That's ceremony. Right. That's all it comes yeah. down to. That's exactly right. Um, this lady, this family in Indiana never refused to give a pizza deliver a pizza, serve a pizza to someone because they're gay or lesbian, homosexual. Never. The question is whether or not you are going to be involved in catering or participating in an event, a ceremony. A ceremony has meaning. Giving somebody a hamburger, that's just your everyday service. But if you're going to cater their wedding, their ceremony, you know, there's been the shoes on the other foot in some of these situations because now there has been some people uh, in the same area of Baronelli Stutzman and the Baker and the others that have had these other uh, forced um, government or lawsuits against them to call people who are known to be uh, homosexual. They may be bakers or florists and want them to cater something that is of a pro-natural marriage celebration. And they have said, no, we're not going to do that. But there's not been any backlash against them. Right. Uh, and there's not any lawsuits against them. And there's no attorney generals or state coming after them. And the people that actually made these inquiries, uh, they were not serious. They were just simply asking the question uh, and finding out if, in fact, they felt the same way, that what's good for the goose is good for the gander, so way, so to speak, that it's a two-way street. And what you find here is that it's a one-way street because they don't want to be forced, and I wouldn't want someone to be forced to participate in my ceremony if that's something that they were uncomfortable with. I'd just go get somebody else to do it that would be comfortable with it. They don't want to be forced to participate in something that's against their view, but they want to force other people to participate with them. And I think the The real thing that's becoming more evident to the people is it's not just about tolerance or coexistence, because that's no longer uh, acceptable. That's no longer the criteria anymore. It's participation and affirmation. If you don't participate and affirm and promote same-sex marriage or a homosexual agenda, then you're going to be targeted. It's like the Chick-fil-A founder. All he said was, I believe in the Bible and in marriage being the union of a man and a woman. Well, Rahm Emanuel, the mayor of New York and the mayor of the District of Columbia said, well, then you can't have a Chick-fil-A in my city. And universities have kicked Chick-fil-A's off the campuses solely because the founder believes in something that is millennia of human history. Uh, It transcends geography and political agendas. And because of that, they want to not allow Chick-fil-A or anyone else to do business to operate or to exist. You know, Matt, I remember growing up, uh, tolerance to me meant, you know, you, you just, we all put up with people that were different than us in a gracious manner. That's what being tolerant meant. And I think you said it well, today there's a redefinition. If we don't, if someone doesn't endorse and support an agenda, in this case we're talking about the gay agenda, you become an enemy. It's no longer... Uh, that uh, it is just there. You have to endorse and support it. Well, that's a dangerous area, isn't it? Because once it really we, is. I mean, it, it's really dangerous. You know, nobody. If you really think about it in any other context, ever, it, it makes sense for the general person. Um, I would not uh, have the audacity, nor want to force uh, a Jewish uh, butcher to uh, butcher a pig and, and come to uh, cook or uh, cut the meat at our hog roast or pig roast that we're having on a picnic. I mean, that, that's exactly. absurd. Exactly. And 
and I would understand, I certainly wouldn't have the audacity or the insensitivity to ask anyway, but I would understand even if I didn't understand it for that person to say, no, I can't do it. Here's why. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. Let me find somebody else. But in this area, there is no tolerance. It, it is a very dangerous situation. What's happening is, going back to Nazism, what they did with the Jews is they dehumanized them. They saw that they would stigmatize them. They wanted to prohibit them from doing business. And eventually it became easier for people not to think of them as humans and then just to eliminate them. What we're seeing happen in this area is if you don't, if you're silent, that's not sufficient anymore. Even if you have your own views, you're not going to share them. That's not sufficient. You've got to speak up. You've got to participate. You've got to affirm. You've got to promote. And if you don't, then you're going to be stigmatized as a bully, a bigot, a hater, uh, someone who's the lowest of the lowest, the scum of the earth. Uh, you can't do your business. You can't have your profession. You can't work in this area. Um, so that is a very dangerous road indeed. And, you know, Matt, I hope people are listening to this, that they understand the root of what you're saying here, how critical this is. Religious liberty, once we start losing our religious liberty, and we're using these examples of making cakes and, and printing stuff, but once that goes, did you hear, Matt, what he said? What follows suit is your economic liberty, political, yeah. your civil liberty. That's next. These things are not, diff they're not separated. These things are tied together. And once we lose our religious liberty, there goes eventually economic and political civil liberty. As well as private property rights. Um, these the business thing. owners have no, uh, no say in what's happening in their businesses. Exactly. It's a domino effect. You know, we're wondering why what happened in, in Indiana, you know, why the legislatures, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, overwhelmingly voted to protect religious liberty. And now this introducing this new law that actually uses the government as a weapon against people, in this uh, instance, Christian yeah. people, who simply want to follow their beliefs on marriage, for example. Now, yeah. it, it isn't because the American people are want this, right? It, I, I heard about that right. Rasmussen poll, right? Wasn't over 70% right. of Americans support the right of a Christian uh, what, f photographer mm -hmm. uh, to decline a same-sex marriage. Right. That's majority. seven out of ten, right. I think the problem that you have here are leaders who um, are so viciously attacked and they're so misrepresented that they want to back up as far as they can, as quickly as they can, and put the controversy to rest. The problem, however, is they make the problem, they make the situation worse than if they never had done anything in the first place. If they had mm -hmm. never even started the religious freedom law, it would be better than starting it and then at the end of the day, passing special preferred privileges for homosexual practices. And that's essentially what the agenda is trying to do. They're trying to eliminate religious freedom and elevate gender identity, which is a very broad term, to a protected and preferred civil rights status. So that's why they're so intentional and they're so deliberate and there's so much lies here is because they've got a broader agenda, and that is humiliate, degrade, stigmatize, distort as much as possible so they can ultimately get their agenda. Because at the end of the day, they're going to sacrifice the messenger in order to get their ultimate objective. So we need to have strong leaders who have solid grounding in worldview, as well as being able to articulate the truth to the people. Because you're right, the people are not the ones that are driving this. It's the media, and we have sometimes weak-kneed politicians who react uh, to this uh, visceral criticism by the left. And there are, uh, yeah, I'd like to talk, there are some corporations as well uh, that seem to have definitely landed on the wrong side of this issue, like Walmart and Yelp and uh, Angie's List. And I heard a lot of people are canceling their, uh, uh, their involvement with Angie's List today. Uh, you, you yeah, can't, in fact, you, you can actually get a 110% refund on your membership, so you can get back more than what you paid. I think people ought to cancel and then tell them why. Uh, they need to uh, be told why. Uh, but these corporations, it, it boggles my mind, John and Jennifer, why these corporations want to get involved in this cultural issue, uh, because they know they're dividing their constituency, their consumer base. 
And I think that they ought to pay the financial price if they're going to do that. Uh, we have the ability to vote with our dollars, and so we can vote to put our dollars someplace else. I wondered about the employees at all these big companies. How they There's a lot of Christian people that work at Walmart and Apple, for example, and you may have leadership that is liberal. But how do the employees feel? They're working for a company that's going against their faith. Yeah, I think that they're not very comfortable. I know we've had conversations with people in these different corporations that are not comfortable. It doesn't reflect their values. I mean, they want to go there, make a living. They're not going there to get in the vortex of the most significant cultural issue of our time. They're going there to do their job. If they wanted to to join an organization that is involved in these issues, they have a choice, but they're there to make a living and, and do their job. And it is unfair to the employees and certainly to the customer base for these corporations to jump into this political fray. It makes absolutely no sense. This happened from a political correctness standpoint with regards to Christmas. And we've been involved with a Christmas campaign for another a number of years. And over the years, it's significantly changed the course of the organizations and corporations where they wanted to censor Christmas. And I think in this particular area, more and more like Cracker Barrel, it came out after the uh, Phil Robertson situation. And they came out and said they were going to eliminate the Duck Dynasty paraphernalia and products from their store. Well, guess what? The American people spoke up, and Cracker Barrel came back a couple of weeks later and said, um, we're sorry we made a big mistake. We underestimated uh, this issue, and um, we're going to not uh, push the Duck Dynasty products from our store. These things that are happening right now have severe implications on our children's future and on our future. Religious liberty is not something that we can take for granted. The reason that this country started was for religious liberty. If we don't have that, we have nothing. I mean, if we can't serve our God the way we need to and not violate our conscience, then we have nothing. I I just want to let everyone locally know that you need to come out Tuesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. at First Church of God in Vero Beach at 58th Avenue to hear Matt Staver of Liberty Council talk about today's battle for religious freedom in our nation. He'll be talking about life, liberty, and family. Come out and join us. Tuesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. And if you would like to share the graphic, we posted it on our Facebook page. So please go ahead and share that with family and friends. Thank you so much, Matt Staver, for joining us today on the Story of Liberty.